We're not going to get the, defi the uh, definitive uh, answer to it. If a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, here's the answer to that. There is no tree. There is no woods. There's no listener. They're all virtual, statistical, and probabilistic. Okay, now how does that work? So a man walks into a woods, okay? This is a virtual man, walks into a virtual woods, and what's rendered for him? What's rendered for him at that instant, because it's probable, because of all the history and the background and so on, that there's a, there's a dead tree standing there, and it's kind of wobbly, but it's still standing, and that's what gets rendered to him. Okay, let's say that this is the first time he's been in that woods, but he sees that dead tree. You know, he goes away, and he comes back five years later, and he walks into the woods, and what's rendered for him? A tree lying on the ground. Why? Because that's probable. Because five years later, probability would say, given the rule set, that because of winds and storms and the natural things that would happen over five years, that tree would fall over. So you see, the tree was standing, then it was laying on the ground, but it didn't have to fall. It was just rendered to him standing, and it was rendered to him laying on the ground, because that's when the measurement was made. And when the measurement's made, you go to the reality is just a probability distribution, just like those particles. Hey, these particles make up all this reality, don't they? I mean, everything here is made up from those little particles. And, those, and just because it happened with photons, it also happens with electrons and protons and atoms. All massy things are just probability distributions until they're measured and come into this reality frame. Okay, that's a fact of physics. So he, it gets rendered based on the probability. So we find out that this whole concept that is said just to be only used for the very tiny little things in quantum mechanics. Only on a subatomic scale does this hold. It doesn't. It holds in everyday life. Our whole life is governed by the same principle. Doesn't that seem odd to you that there's this general physical principle and it only holds for little things? No, it holds for everything. It's one principle. Okay, so um, let's go on to the next one. I'm, I'm seeing Shirley eyeing that big hook. I need to, I need to move on before she... Uh, it's after me. Okay, you are consciousness experiencing a virtual reality generated by consciousness. So you see, you're part of the creation as well as part of the, you know, as well as the experiencer. You're the creator and the experiencer both. Okay, the system's designed to facilitate its own evolution by facilitating our evolution and gives us a PMR where experience and feedback, you know, facilitates that. Now, uh, consciousness intent changes the probabilities. So we talked about that future probable database. Your consciousness can change the future, can change those probabilities because your consciousness, the system's consciousness, the reality is just data. Okay, now how does that work? Well, you've heard of the power of positive thinking, right? 1950-something, uh, Norman Vincent Peale wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. Well, everybody knows that's obvious, right? If you think positive, Positive things tend to happen. If you're a very negative person and you're just gross about how awful life is, you end up having a lot of awful things you have to deal with. That's the power of positive thinking, uh, a very obvious thing. I know people who uh, create parking spaces for themselves because when they leave their home going to a congested area, they'll, in their mind, visualize a parking space just opening up just as they get there because if it opens up too soon, somebody else will snag it, right? So they have one open up just in time for them and they work on that and if they apply their mind to that, they find that about 80% of the time, they get a parking space. If they don't do it, about 80% of the time, they don't get a parking space. People hail taxi cabs in the same way that live in cities. You have to visualize that taxi cab. You have to see it. You have to apply your mind to it. And you can make those things happen for you. Right? That's kind of, you know, we do that sort of thing a lot. I have another guy. He says that he walks in a grocery store now. He never gets a cart as he goes in. He materializes a cart inside the grocery store. So he can just walk through the doors, and there's one just sitting on the floor with nothing in it. And he picks that up. And he says that works about 80% of the time when he does it. So these are little games that you can, you know, that you can play to see how that works. Okay, well, what about prayer? Okay, prayer works. Why? Because you have people focusing their intent, that intent, modifies the probabilities of the way things happen. What about healing? That's how healing works. You heal, not because that little black thing, you know, disappears with that, you know, that imaginary black thing, or that, that symbol black thing with that symbol light. All those symbols are doing, those are just tools and metaphors that help you focus your intent. It's your intent that changes the probabilities. Consciousness is the only active ingredient going on here. The rest of it is just tools. All right. Um, 
What about the placebo effect? Very widely known effect in medicine, right? You give people a, a, a pill that's got sawdust in it or something, and, uh, and most people say sugar, but sugar's so bad for you, I can't say that. So <laughs> it gives you, gives you a pill with, with uh, sawdust in it or just cellulose, and they take that pill and they're told the same thing that people are told to take the medicine. They're told this is a wonderful new pill, we've just invented it, it's great, it's gonna cure your disease. They take that pill and about 30% of them makes them better. And it's not that it makes them feel better or just think they're better, it actually heals them, makes them better. How are they, he how are they healed? How does the placebo effect work? It works because they now have a positive intent and that positive intent modifies the probabilities, okay? And once you modify those probabilities, you're modifying what you're gonna find when you take that measurement, right? You're modifying that probability function. You're modifying the, the probability wave function, if you will. Okay, now that takes us to one that's kind of been rampant in the last uh, some years. What about the law of attraction, right? That law of attraction, that's, a, uh, that's the same sort of thing, right? You use your mind and your intent to program, they say the universe, but it's really the larger conscious system, to give you what you want. Okay, well, that works in that you use that intent, you can modify the probabilities, sure enough. But beware, you have a system that is generated to help you evolve and has this feedback in it so that your intent does modify future probabilities. Therefore, it modifies your future choices that you make, future measurements, the results of future measurements. But at the same time, this system is here to help us evolve. That means lowering your entropy by getting rid of ego, getting rid of fear, becoming love. So now take a system that is evolved to respond to your positive intent and to help you drop your ego. You see, you're asking if you, if you use this law of attraction to aggrandize your ego, to get stuff because you want it, because it makes you big and important and so on, then you're asking a system to use itself against itself. What's probably going to happen is that you may even get what you ask for, but you're also going to get a lesson that comes with it that will help you decrease that ego. And here's an example. There was um, a fellow who wanted $100,000. He just wanted, he just, if his life would be perfect if he had $100,000, so he spent his time focused on that $100,000. He saw pictures of a man walking down a corridor in a suit, handing him a check for $100,000. He worked on it, and worked on it, and worked on it. About four months later, his mother and father, his brother and his sister, and all their children all died in an automobile collision. And he was the sole heir and he got $100,000, and that man walked down that aisle and handed it to him just like he saw it. Well, now there's a lesson in ego. So if you're going to ask a system to work against itself, you, uh, you better be careful, not necessarily what you ask, but why you ask it. It needs to be for the right reasons. So yes, law of attraction works, but it's, don't ask it to uh, work with your ego. All right, synchronicity, how does that work? Okay, we talk about synchronicity. Jim mentioned that. I'll explain to you how that works. A system only has to compute um, the probability of the next thing happening according to history and rule set. Remember, those are the two things. Okay. A weak history provides for multiple solutions. Whenever you have uncertainty, the system only has to abide by those two rules. So if any one of those rules is loose, then the system has leeway. Right, to, to the solution that it can provide for you. All right, so let's look at an example. Um, you go away for two weeks, you come back, you've been in airports, airplanes, all day long, your throat's kinda, kinda sore, you'd like a nice carbonated beverage, so you open up your refrigerator door and there's no beer in the refrigerator. And you know that there was at least three or four beer in that refrigerator when you left. And then you think, what happened to the beer? You go, oh, I bet the guy that comes in that gives the dog, you know, water and food, he's been drinking my beer, I bet. Well, perhaps not. You see, unless you took a picture of what was inside that refrigerator, it's not really a part of the record. It's just your memory. And, you know, everybody knows memory plays tricks on you, right? And memory's not that uh, good. So when it come times to open that door, what are you doing? You're making a measurement. When you open that door, you're making a measurement of what's inside that refrigerator. Well, if you had taken a picture of what was inside there and you could see that there were four bottles of beer sitting in there, then the probability 
distribution for that four bottles of beer would be a real sharp.